next speaker is uh, John Garrard uh, from ArcelorMittal. He is the j division manager and talent acquisition. So I'm sure that the students will be wide-eyed. And uh, John is the division management or talent acquisition for ArcelorMittal, the largest steel company in the United States and the world. He is responsible for employment and college relations initiatives for ArcelorMittal. And I'm happy to welcome John. When I saw the email about whether or not we could participate in this panel, the email was something <laughs> along the line of, you know, what is ArcelorMittal looking for and what do employers in general want in today's hires? And I thought to myself, well, the answer is easy. We want everything. We have anybody in career services here in the room? Okay, employers, help me finish this question. You go into a placement director's office. You go to Tim Luzader's office across the street. Tim, we want your help hiring the best and the brightest, right? Mm -hmm. We're all looking for pretty much the same animal. It's how we go about it and how the students approach it that really makes the difference. Here's the clicker. A couple of things that come to my mind when I think about talent acquisition, and I tell all of our recruiters, we have over 500 individuals that are trained now to do selection interviews. Two things ring true to me uh, about the whole selection process. One is a quote from Tom Peters. And the quote was, profit is a derivative of good talent. The essence there is, that's a strategic initiative. You can have the best equipment in the world. If you don't have the right people at the throttle, you don't have anything. And the second thing is, no amount of retraining will ever correct poor selection. Invest at the front end. Make sure you're doing the right things right at the front end. Because I used to have a graphic that showed a frog sticking its tongue out and grabbing a fly. And, it, and the uh, presumed wife of this is talking to one of her friends saying, I knew he was a frog when I married him, but I thought I could change it. That's never going to happen. Uh, just very quickly, I want to give you a snapshot of a very dynamic and very volatile industry, the steel industry. A little bit about who we are, what I consider the total packages, what apologies to uh, Phil Gardner, who's a good friend of mine at Michigan State who does a survey every year, and Phil came up with that title, and I think you'll see what he's talking about. What are we looking for? What are the core competencies that ArcelorMittal are, is looking for? Uh, and for the students, how do you succeed in an interview? Uh, and then, you know, what did Dean Early say? The fit feels right right? The whole notion of job fit and making sure that you present that kind of an image to a potential employer. Uh, we'll talk about candle power and what that is, but we'll also talk about this whole notion of motivational fit. And then my concept of make your own luck along the way. That's a pretty dynamic slide. Since 1997, all of those companies, all steel company related or metals related companies, have gone out of business in the United States. That's why I'm talking about a very dynamic and tumultuous industry. This is who we are. We're a combination of Middle Steel and Arcelor. Arcelor was the largest steel company in Europe. It was acquired in, I believe, 2006, making Arcelor Middle the largest steel company in the world. We, at that time, were actually three times larger than our closest comp uh, competition by volume. Here in the United States, we're a steady in consolidation. Uh, all of the companies on the left-hand side morphed into the companies in the middle and now make up the six remaining companies on the right-hand side. Basically, we're number one in the world in every continent. What do we do here? Okay. This is where we're located in the United States. Well, we have about 18 or 19 sites here in the United States. And one thing to consider, Purdue just launched a program called Made in Indiana, I believe, right? Uh, and ArcelorMittal is featured in that program. Of about the 18,000 people that we have working here in the United States, 
approximately 60% of that workforce works and lives here in Indiana or neighboring Illinois. So we are a major employer within the state of Indiana. Who are our customers? Who drives a car here? <laughs> I steals in it, I guarantee it, okay? We are the major automotive supplier to the world. In terms of other kinds of markets, we're certainly into structural steels. In fact, the, uh, whoops, let me get back to that one. The beams that are going into the, uh, the tower in New York right now are actually manufactured at our plant in Differdage, I believe. They're shipped here to the United States. It's one of the few plants in the world that can make a beam as large as required for that building. They're finished and then taken to the construction site. In terms of wind power, anybody that drove down here from Chicago or, or points north obviously went through the wind, uh, the wind fields, uh, either off of I-65 or uh, Route 52, and those are pretty amazing to watch. Uh, a lot of our plate is in those wind towers. Uh, and in terms of the automobile industry, uh, again, we, we manufacture to all the major auto, automobile, automobile producers in the United States. We've heard a lot, too, about corporate social responsibility, and ArcelorMittal is a good neighbor. Uh, in 2010, we donated almost $5 million to charitable and civic organizations in the United States. And the other point I want to reference there is this one, the Campus Partnership Program. <coughs> When we kicked that program off four years ago, there were four corner sco cornerstone schools, and Purdue was one of them. Uh, we take a very active stance in terms of, of de develop, trying to develop programs and produce or generate resources at the campus level that will help programs be more effect effective on campus and in return generate students that are potential employees for our organization. Uh, let's, let's start talking about the workforce in general right now. 56% of those 65 and older work full-time compared to only 44% three or 13 years ago. Uh, we've all heard about our 201K plans because they're worth half of what they used to be worth. <laughs> but the reality of the workforce is that in the next three to five years, there has to be some pretty dynamic change. We see that in our workforce with approximately 50% of the salaried and hourly workforce considered sole option eligible or eligible to retire today if they wanted to. And we know we can take the brightest electrical or mechanical engineer out of any school here in the country and have to invest probably at least two to three years in that individual because they've never run a basic oxygen furnace. They've never run a temper mill. They've never run a tandem mill. They've never run a galvanized line. There's a substantial amount of industry-specific knowledge that we have to invest in a young associate before they can really strap that job on. 51% of the salaried workforce is over 40 years of age, 20% growth in the number of workers 55 years, years of age by the year 2020, and 47% of the workforce will be millennials or Gen Y by 2014. We have a workforce that's kind of like this in the middle, okay? Uh, what are we looking for? These are our, the GMB is the group management board. That's the top echelon of the house in, in London. And basically they said, these are the skills and abilities that we're looking for. We're looking for people who can deal with change management because our, our environment is changing virtually daily, okay? We once had a vice president of human resources. His name will ring in this room, I think, a little bit because his name is Morgan Burke. Morgan Burke described the steel industry as perpetual whitewater, and it really has been and continues to be. You can see that from the initial slides of the bankruptcies and in, in, uh, uh, consolidations. Uh, people who can make decisions, uh, there's an old story about Donald Trump. Uh, after the first episode <coughs> of, what is it called, The Apprentice? I don't watch it, so I don't really know. The guy named Rancic won. Remember Rancic? He told Rancic, that if he made a bad decision, he would support him. If he made a good decision, he would support him. If he didn't make a decision, he would fire him. Okay? You want people who can make decisions, particularly on their feet. Uh, results orientation, it's all about process. Uh, we've just completed an upgrade of one of our plate mills. Uh, the budgeted price 
for that was, I believe, $67 million to upgrade one facility. Uh, the guy who runs that shop, the COO, a guy by the name of John Mangle, won't say what the actual real cost was. Uh, but John is also what we would consider to be our executive sponsor here at Purdue. For every one of, I mentioned there were four schools initially, there are now 11. But every one of those schools has somebody on the leadership team that's run by our CEO, Mike Rippey, uh, to serve as a resource in terms of how we invest our time, capital, and resources on campus. Uh, and then certainly teamwork. Uh, virtually everything we do, because of the size and scope of everything we do, we rely on one blast furnace at the Indiana Harbor facility. Anybody want to take a guess on the cost? Basically $100 million to rely on one piece of equipment. So the tremendous team efforts in terms of the logistics and planning and, and capital that goes involved in all of those processes. Then also stakeholder orientation, effective communication, both written and oral, and a learning development orientation, lifelong learning. We even have our own virtual university called ArcelorMittal USA, where there are hundreds of courses, including English as a second language, because people in 60 countries around the world need to understand English, which is the recognized language of the corporation. Now, this is Phil's total package and what I really believe in, and this starts at the selection process. And it's really not more complicated than certainly we want to see academic performance. Academic performance is a, is a function of candle power. It's the ability to learn, the ability to assimilate information, the ability to communicate effectively. We're also looking for people that have demonstrated leadership skills. People in our organization are going to move up quickly because of the demographic profile of the organization. They're going to have to be in a position to be able to lead others, in some cases maybe even a little bit older than they are. And finally, work experience. And this is the value of internships. Uh, I think there isn't a student in the room that doesn't recognize the importance of having an internship on their resume. Uh, it isn't certainly something that w that's a knockout, but it does present a competitive advantage over every other student that doesn't have one. Okay? But that's really what we're looking for to start out. Where does all that start? Starts in the interview. And the old thought process was that the interviewer kind of held all the cards. And what David referred to, I mean, I'm sitting here going, holy cow, I mean, we need to talk. I mean, we've, we're even starting our own program called Steelworker of the Future to train people to be in positions where they can deal with mechanical and electrical craft because there aren't people on the street who can do those jobs right now. But it's getting to the point where, in fact, I was at a workshop the other day in Chicago, what employers are saying is that 52% uh, of the employers surveyed uh, indicate that uh, they're, they're uh, experiencing increasing competitiveness for mar in the marketplace for top talent. 49% are saying that there's a shortage of required positions for their jobs. There are, you know, we were talking earlier about the unemployment rate out there, and the unemployment rate in the country may be anywhere from 8% to 14% in some places, maybe higher. But there are jobs out there that are going wanting because people don't have the skill sets to be able to perform that work. And that's where your organization, I think, play a key role. What do we look for? Anybody seen this before? Everybody heard the concept of behavioral-based interviewing? It's not rocket science, but it's a way to deep drill and get past the, I was the best salesman in my territory. Well, how many salesmen were there in your territory? Well, one. How'd you get your job? Well, dad gave it to me. <laughs> Uh, you know, this is a way to, to get into what was the situation you were involved in, the actions or the heart of the star, what, what, did, what did you do, what was your role in the project or assignment, and then specifically what was the result, okay? If you haven't, if you're a student and aren't aware of this concept, of, it's sometimes called BBI, behavioral based interviewer, or targeted selection interview, which is a DDI product, I would strongly encourage you to, to study up on that and be ready to do some things like this. Employers who ask you, well, if you were in this situation, what would you do? That's the world's worst question. Why? Because it's a theoretical question, and you're going to give them a theoretical answer. What you want to find out is, how did someone react in past circumstances that are similar to the job, 
and was the, was the outcome positive or negative. The most important prep work that you can do is to determine the requirements for the job and then make sure you're prepared to address them. Okay? This says if, if I had actually done half of the things on my resume, I would have had a pretty impressive and fulfilling life. <laughs> uh, the bottom line there is be brutally honest on any application form or any resume that you produce because employers are checking. You don't want to fudge anything. Okay? Uh, match dimensions, knowledge, skills, behaviors, and motivations that the applicant has to the job. That's the, that's the fit. And then what employers are looking for in terms of your answers are three things. And this is how they weigh the answers that you give. Are the an is the answer that you're giving similar to the job? Is it recent to the job? Or was it something you did back in high school when you were assigned a project? And what was the impact of that? Did you decide to send out emails or memos on colored paper? Or did it change a process and procedure within the organization or with, within the project team that you were working on? What contribution did you make? Uh, and then beyond candle power. Uh, candle power is, is brights. It's, it's the, the mental toolkit that you bring to the job. And I would venture to say that virtually any student at Purdue is going to have the candle power to do most of the jobs that we want. It's the want to. It's the motivational fit piece that our people will really probe with you. Do you want to work in an industrial environment? Uh, do you want to work in northwest Indiana? Do you want to work in Cleveland? Because there are three facets there. Uh, location fit. Are you willing to, or to relocate? Organizational fit. Does the job fit with the kinds of things that you like to do? Does it fit with your, uh, with your uh, physical desires or, or wishes? And then clearly the, the biggest piece of all is job fit. What motivates you? And do the things that are offered within the job motivate you to be successful? If they don't, look somewhere else. Because you're not going to be successful in the job and you're going to be in a situation where the employer won't be either. So he's not much of a chef, but if you want your pizza, pizza sliced perfectly, isosceles is your man. <laughs> um, that's matching the right individual for the right job. That's all that speaks to, and that's key. Okay. Uh, in terms of, I've showed you our competencies in terms of what DDI, uh, Development Dimensions International, says are the key things virtually all employers are looking for. If you prepare for those things in an interview, chances are you're going to be successful in that interview. Continuous learning and growth in our op operation for individuals who come in at the associate level and want to pursue an advanced degree, we have a tuition reimbursement program in addition to ArcelorMittal Middle University that provides $24,000 a year to pursue an advanced degree. That's a pretty good opportunity. Uh, teamwork and collaboration, communication certainly, decision making and initiative. Those are the key things that virtually every employer is going to be looking for uh, in a new hire. And then lastly, this is an old football coach of mine. When you people talk about good luck in the interview, there is no such thing. Luck is where preparation meets opportunity. You prepare for the opportunity and seize the opportunity. Okay? We'll hold the questions till late. Okay?